Hey guys, I'm going to show you three games that I've just recently played, talk through my thought process, what I was thinking, why I played the moves I played, and all three of these games had very nice finishes at the end, which I think you will enjoy. Let's go ahead and take a look at this first game here. So I was playing with the white pieces, and we have a Carol Khan, and I played my normal gambit line here where I let them capture, and instead of retaking, I play bishop c4, and usually I'll follow that up with f3 and then gambit that pawn okay and this is a lot of fun this person played knight f6 and then instead of taking it they struck at the center with e5 and i remember that i had seen this line with stockfish before and it actually says the best thing to do is just take it uh, which kind of looks a little weird and i forgot that after they take here the best thing is actually to take with the king and i think the reasoning is even though you're giving up castling rights you have the knight here, which is really kind of controlling where black's knight might want to hop to later. And so I think that's kind of the, the reasoning. I forgot that in the game and captured with the knight, and, and I was just trying to be able to castle later, which actually worked out in my favor. But according to Stockfish, the best move really is to take with the king. So they captured here. And obviously, when you, know, you see a position like this, you want to take the knight because it's a knight and it's a pawn. It's a good trade. The reason I couldn't get away with that now is because of this move right here. And if I do this, I'll just show you, black's gonna capture here and I have no way to stop this from happening. Now I'm losing, well, that's not true. I can move my knight there and take the queen, but I'm still losing my rook in the corner, which is not a good trade, right? So I have to deal with this threat. And so because of that, I just captured it. The reason that I take with the knight and not the pawn is because I wanna develop my pieces, right? I don't want all my pieces to be stuck uh, on the back rank. And so if that's kind of a no brainer for me, I take with the knight also supports my pawn here. Black has to make a decision about where does the knight go. And they go here, which I don't like that for black because it kind of bottles up their pieces, right? It, you know, these guys can't come out. And now it's like, I have two pieces out. Black sort of has one developed, but you're going to see what happens here after Bishop E3, I castled. And now I'm, I'm pretty much done with my development. I have one piece here and then I'm ready to start attacking stuff. And black is still trying to figure out what's happening with these guys. Is Are they going to castle or not? And so I'm feeling pretty good here. They do castle, and I played e6. And what I'm trying to do is, is two things. Number one, if I can dislodge this knight, then this bishop is going to be able to be captured. So that's kind of part of what I'm doing. The other part is if I can open up this diagonal, then maybe I can actually attack black's king. And my rook is lined up, and maybe my knight can come in. And this is a pretty common thing. Um if you can take advantage of this diagonal with your you know your bishop and open that up it can be very dangerous for black even with queens off the board now if queens are on the board it would be even more dangerous but since they're not i'm gonna you know make the best of what i have so my opponent captured here i believe they were afraid of you know the knight having to move and then their bishop would be undefended and so they thought that they would just trade it but i really like this for me because now not only do i recapture the trade I also get to make a really useful move, get, getting that knight off of the back, which now means this rook can come over and this knight is, is maybe ready to attack, right? We're going to see that in just a minute. So opponent captured here and I took it. And just like I was mentioning, now I've opened up that diagonal and I'm ready to, to attack the king. And that's exactly what I did, knight to g5. And now black has to be very careful here because I have two rooks ready to attack. Black doesn't have his other rook. So for example, if black you know, plays a move like this, I'm going to recapture and notice how now I'm the only one who has a rook playing in this game. Black is playing without a rook, without a knight, without a bishop. You can see it's basically four pieces against one. There's no way that black could survive this. There's just no way. So uh, that's one thing. So black decided to play knight to f6, trying to just block me off. At least it keeps this rook out of the game, right? And so it's kind of like these pieces are playing against these pieces for the most part. And here I was thinking about playing knight to f7 check. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the smothered checkmate, it looks a lot like this. You would bring your knight in. This is not what I played in the game, but I just want to illustrate a point. The smothered checkmate works like this. You bring your knight in with check. The king moves. You would go with a double check with your knight. And usually this is a queen. And if this was a queen, when the king goes back, you could actually sacrifice your queen. And a lot of times you could end up with the checkmate. Um, this case, obviously, it's a bishop. It doesn't work. So that doesn't apply. But I was thinking along the lines, sorry, of should I go here and do I have any tactics available? I couldn't quite see anything. So instead, I said, okay, 
what else can I do? Am I worried if this takes me here? Not really, I can capture with my knight and my knight would be lining up here. So I thought about the move knight to f5 because what I was thinking was that, okay, if, if black does take me, which seems like the most logical move to trade their bad bishop for my strong bishop, then I would recapture with a fork here. And yes, black can defend it, but then I was trying to think through if I could get away with this, trading here and then bringing this rook over right away. I wasn't sure where, I was thinking maybe here, maybe here, and trying to come down and, and invade. Now, is this good enough? I don't know, because black has the two knights which are kind of defending each other. It might have not been good enough, but that's kind of what I was thinking through and decided that I would go for knight f5, um, which, yeah, the stockfish says that's a good move. But uh, my opponent here made a critical mistake, knight to a6, and I have a very nice move now. If you would like to pause, what do you think I played next? All right, if you had a chance to look at that, I played knight to f7 check, and previously this wasn't such a great move because the king could just move there, and then yes, I, I would have a discovered check, but I didn't really have any great places to go to, but now if the king moves over, I have a fantastic follow-up. Knight to e7 is checkmate. This is actually what happened in the game. My opponent played king jade, and I just checkmated him. Um, it's amazing, right? But uh, it just shows how like these active pieces... Even without the queen on the board, you can still get checkmate, you know? And so my opponent had to sacrifice the rook here, um, which would still be a great position for me. I, I win the exchange, and the game goes on, but I'm doing just, just fine. So, yeah, really nice game there, and uh, I hope you learned something from that. Um, but, yeah, let's jump over to game number two. All right, so here's the second game. My opponent played c3, which is a really weird move. Um, and so a lot of times when somebody plays a weird move like this, the best thing to do is just get the center. Like, just push one of your pawns to the center. It doesn't even usually matter. I uh, just push one to the center. So that's what I did. I just played e5. They played d4. We traded. And now we end up with, it looks like a queen's gambit. But we get a, basically a queen's gambit exchange variation. So just to show you what I'm talking about, if they would have played d4, d5, c4, and I play e6, if they exchange, we end up with this exact same position. So going back to the actual game, we ended up in the same position in a different way right? But now it's like, okay, pr pretty familiar, something that I'm used to playing. So they played bishop to f4, knight to f6. Uh, I'm just developing my pieces to good squares. That's all I'm doing. I'm not overthinking this. And now I'm kind of counteracting their bishop here along this diagonal, and at the same time developing and getting ready to castle. General rule is you want to castle before move 10. That's what I'm trying to do. All right. I played c6. This is pretty common. This is how you support your pawn. It also lets out your queen. So that's why I played this. It wasn't a whole lot of thought happening here. Knight to f3, bishop to f5. So I figured since they didn't put a piece here on this diagonal, why not go ahead and put my, my bishop there? Okay, so bishop f5, knight c3. I traded that, and then I played h6. This is, um, why did I do this? I wanted to play knight b to d7, connecting my knights. And finishing my development but if i go here now i just lose a bishop right and so i can't do that it's a blunder so i figured let me trade it off and then why did i play h6 two reasons number one it shuts down the rook so the rook's not doing anything now whenever you have a rook on an open file like this or a half open file one of the best things to do is to put a pawn forward so that it's defended by another pawn and the rook doesn't really do much it's just hitting a, a pawn right so that's why i played h6 a secondary reason was that if this knight ever tries to come and hunt down my bishop, I could always retreat it back to h7 and it's safe. And I'm still keeping control of that bishop and I don't have to trade it for a knight. So that's kind of a twofold reason for playing h6. Okay, so bishop e2. And now I was able to complete my development like I wanted to. Castles, castles, pretty even game here. Now, one thing that you're going to see, yeah, b4 my opponent played, which this is a standard plan in these queen's, queen's gambit um, exchange variation type setup. So when these pawns get traded like they did in the queen's gambit, even though we had a different line, um, this is called a minority attack. And essentially what white is trying to do is attack with these two pawns against three, these three pawns, hence the term minority, and they want to create a weakness, okay? So I played rook to e8, getting my rook on the half open file, and they played b5. And this is kind of the point. If they can trade this off, they've created what's called a backward pawn, and it's a good target. They can, you know, maybe bring the queen and the rook and, and line up on that pawn, and it can be tough for me to defend it. So that's what white's doing. I played queen to a5, trying to kind of make some counter threats here and put my queen on a good square. 
they play queen b3, I brought my knight in. So a lot of times when your opponent is attacking you with the minority attack, you either have two options. You can try to stop it, but in this case, they've already got their pawn so far advanced, they're ready to trade. There's not really much I can do. And by the way, if you're wondering why I didn't just, like, let's say, take it, notice how now both of these pawns are really weak. And they can actually just take this one and leave this one here for later. It's still kind of weak. And they take my center pawn. Now, this is a passed pawn. And it's it's really not what I wanted to do, okay? Uh, giving up that pawn, it's kind of significant. It's just a very valuable pawn to keep on the board right now. So knight to e4. Um, I don't know if I finished my thought. The, the two options that you have when somebody is minority attacking you here. Uh, option one is you try to prevent it, which I couldn't really do. Option two is you kind of counterattack. A lot of times that's on the king side or in the center. Um, and that's what I was going for here. So trying to create some, some counter threats with my pieces. All right, so he does that, captures. And here, white has actually gotten what they want. Okay, this is the backward pawn that I'm talking about. It's, it's difficult for me to push this forward because um, there's you know, pieces that can take it. Now, in this case, my queen on a5 is actually supporting it nicely. I was able to get away with that. I don't think I played it right now, uh, but I did set that up and eventually was able to play c5. Yeah, so, you know, if I just leave this sit here and he's able to get two rooks, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for me to ever play this. It's going to be a, a target. You know, this knight might come in or maybe the, the bishop can loop around and attack it. And that's really not what I want. So I, I figured this is the moment to go ahead and try to trade it off. And that's what I did. So he took, I took, and he plays over here and I trade. So I got rid of that weakness. Now this is still an isolated pawn, but it's not as weak. I have my bishop sitting in there nicely defending it. And um, yeah, I figured that was a good trade. All right, so now we're in this kind of end game. And you know, a lot of times in situations like this, you wanna keep an eye on the back rank because it could be checkmate. In this case, it's not the case. Um, I have an escape for my king, so there's not going to be any checkmates here. White has an escape for their king. There's not going to be any checkmates here. But what I noticed was that I could actually bring my knight here, and it's controlling that square, and, and maybe at some point in the future, there, there could be a threat back here, right? Because of the way the pawns are set up. You know, a lot of times, the pawns on h3, it'll stop my knight from going there. But in this case, it doesn't. So that's why I play knight to f6. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this move. Also, it, it defends these nicely, and it puts it uh, on a square where my knight's defended, right? So there's a lot of things about that move that I like. Engine, of course, has reasons which I don't understand, but whatever. Um, that's why I played it. Anyway, white is going for a very simple plan of let me try to take this pawn and activate my rook along the seventh rank, which makes a lot of sense. But I noticed that I could set a little trap here, and this is a very serious threat. If white doesn't deal with this, I actually saw something, and my opponent missed it. Uh, they were playing quickly, and they captured the pawn. So if you would like to pause, what was the follow-up that I was planning on playing? Well, if you had a chance to look at that, I basically already said it, right? I wanted to come down with check, and now I have some serious threats. Number one is if they block, I'm going to bring my bishop in, and this is pinned, and yet it's attacked, and, and white is all tied up. Yes, they can move their knight somewhere and defend it, but they're still all tied up. Their pieces are going to be stuck for a while. Right? For example, if they play knight to h2, none of these pieces can move now. Now, mine are kind of going to be sitting here, but white seems very tied up. They can't ever move here, or I take it. They can't ever move the knight away, or I take this. They can't ever move the bishop because it's pinned. Like, they're just all stuck. And my knight's basically free to kind of run around, and my rook can still come over here, and uh, really nice position for me. Instead, my opponent played king to h2, which is even worse. It's even worse, and actually leads to checkmate if you would like to pause and try to find it, uh, see if you can see what I played next. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, this was a fun one. I played knight to g4 check. It forces the king up. Then I captured the pawn check, which again forced, well, if the king goes back, this is just checkmate immediately. So it does force the king up. And after that, I played rook over and my opponent resigned because if you look carefully, there's no way for the king to escape. The only thing they could do would be to move here, and then I would simply take it checkmate. So really nice checkmate. Again, we see a checkmate where queens are off the board, and the the, the three pieces are delivering the mate, right? So, you know, you got to be looking for these opportunities. Even if queens aren't on the board, you still have to be careful with your king placement, and my opponent did not do that in this game. All right.
Hope you guys enjoyed that one. There's one more game. Let's take a look at that one, which also features a pretty nice checkmate at the end as well. All right, so here's the third game. This was against an international master um, and bishop c4. I played knight c3, d3. This is just theory. This is, you know, lines that I teach in my, my opening courses. So I'm not really thinking about any of these moves. I basically know that this is good stuff. Now, right here, most people here don't actually take this. They play d6. And I usually play f5, and I'm a little bit more familiar with those positions. This person took it, and I knew that recapturing couldn't be bad. But after this, on, let's see, yeah, knight to d4. This is kind of a surprising move to me. I was like, hmm, interesting. I don't actually know what, what exactly is going on here. And I thought, let me try to get rid of that knight in the center by bringing my knight back. That's basically what I was planning. And it does two things. It attacks it. It also makes way for my c-pawn. To if I need more support, I can, you know, do that as well. So that's why I did that. And now my opponent is trying to take advantage of the dark square. So, you know, one thing that you have to watch out for in chess is if you see your opponent positioning a bunch of pieces all attacking the same color squares, you want to watch out. So what do I mean by that? Well, this bishop is attacking the dark squares. Boom, 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 boom. This knight is now attacking the dark squares. Notice how my pawns also are on white squares, which means they're not defending the dark squares. So I, I really only have this bishop and this knight defending these dark squares right around here, this, this area. And also, the queen is about to come in with the check, again, attacking dark squares. So notice how I have to be careful because of all of this stuff. That's what I'm trying to tell you, okay? I played bishop g3. Apparently, Stockfish was saying queen d2 was the best move. Notice how queen d2 does kind of help support those dark squares, defending some of these things. But you have to watch out because you could very easily fall for tricks in these types of positions. So I think one that I've fallen for before is, is d4, um, which is like, okay, I'm just you know pushing forward. I'm attacking the bishop. But watch what happens. Knight takes f4. And if I just simply take this, the queen comes over. Now I have to move my king. I'm losing my knight. And the dark squares are, are really what's hurting me right? The weakness is on the dark squares. So that's what you have to watch out for. Anyway, um, bishop g3. And again, my opponent is trying to take advantage of those, th those things, right? So I played d4 primarily because I wanted somewhere for my queen to move. One, you know, one of the most dangerous things about this position to me was that my queen couldn't move. Unless I'm wanting to go over to b1, which is not where I want my queen to be, right? Can't go here. I can't go here. It's stuck. Whenever your queen is stuck, that's probably not a good sign, right? So, and there's not really a good way to get rid of this bishop. Yes, I can play bishop f2, but then I'm giving black the option to trade and bring the queen in. And again, my king is getting attacked along these dark squares. I didn't like the looks of that. Now, Stockfish is saying it's playable. Just go to king to e3. But this looks crazy, right? I didn't want to do that in a game. So I, that's why I played d4. I'm like, I'm going to, oh, sorry. Um, that's why I played d4. I'm like, I'm going to bring my queen up here attack that bishop and it also opens up to maybe at some point in the future castle queenside and get away from the the attack over here so bishop to h3 i did play queen d3 creating that attack and here my opponent made a mistake and so if you would like to pause why is this not a good move and what did i do to take advantage of that All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, this is not an easy tactic. This is a, I would say, an advanced tactic. But um, the way that you would want to think about this, this is the way that I found it in the game, was I'm attacking the bishop. Um, I'd like to be able to take it, but I can't because it's defended. I also noticed that this bishop over here was undefended, and it was in line with my queen. Now, some of you are saying, Nelson, there's three pieces in front of the queen. Like, you can't just take it, right? That's true. But the move that I played was f4. And what I noticed was that f4 most likely was going to result in a big trade, like a bishop or a knight or something, and then, you know, a bunch of trading. And if, if that happened, guess what? These pieces are all going to be gone, right? And then, oh, maybe, they're, maybe I can take the bishop. So then it's just a question of, well, does is black forced to make the trade? And yes, they are, because if they don't make the trade, the queen's got to move. But if the queen moves, the bishop's undefended, right? So it was kind of like putting all these pieces together. Um, like I said, not an easy tack. This is a more advanced one, but I did see that it was going to work out, and I played f4. Now, my opponent could, could take two different ways, and I would have to be careful with, with how I captured, but 
regardless, there was going to be a way to make it work out in my favor. And so here I took with the bishop. Why did I take with the bishop? Um, I think they're both good, but I wanted to force the recapture so that I could win the piece. If I take with the knights, I was thinking, what, what was I thinking actually? I don't know. I, I was thinking that maybe black could do some good. I don't think they really actually could. Anyway, so it probably doesn't matter in this case, but sometimes you have to be careful and it does matter. Um, this case looks like maybe it didn't matter, but yeah, anyway, I wanted to force the, the recapture, which this does. And then um, I just took this free piece. So I'm just up a piece. And now it's just a question of, can I win with this advantage? Now my opponent did play on. This is a little bit of an annoying move. I can't castle now, right? So we have to deal with that. But I was able to bring the rook over. And then here, uh, rook to g3. So why did I play rook to g3? I could have just traded queens and the game was going to go on. I actually thought that I was going to win the bishop here by playing rook to g3. I was thinking that the queen had to move away somewhere. Like, let's just say it takes a pawn and then I can capture the bishop. Uh, I actually just forgot that they could just go back to h6 and it's still defense. So I didn't really see that, but it's still the same thing. We get a queen trade and the game goes on. Played c3. I wanted to move my king out so that I could use my rook. So at the end of the game, you have to make sure you're using all of your pieces. This one is doing great. This one's pretty nice, uh, you know, doing quite a bit of stuff. This one looks pretty good. This guy in the corner is not doing anything. So I needed to get that out, but I couldn't move my king up because the bishop. That's why I played c3. Also, c3 is a nice move, kind of just supports my center. All right. I defended my pawn. It was being attacked. Pretty straightforward. And h4. Um... You know, I said I wanted to activate this, and I still do. The reason I'm not in a hurry is because this position is pretty tame. There's not a lot of threats that black has. You know, black can't really do anything right now with their rooks and their bishop. My position is very solid. So I knew I was going to have time to play this later. And I said, you know what, let me just go ahead and get this pawn ready to go because I, I'm going to want to do that as well. So I didn't really feel like it mattered the order that I played those moves in. Okay, so that's why I you know did that first. All right, I pushed here. I just didn't want to open up like my king and allow the rook to come over and it gets kind of complicated. I just felt like my position was so solid. I may as well just keep it locked up. Same thing here, just stopping black from really getting any kind of counterplay. And here we go. This is an isolated pawn anyway, so trading it off makes sense. Also, it opens up a file where I could use this rook and have both rooks kind of lined up on the king. Made a lot of sense. Okay, so that's what I did. And now... I'm trying to take advantage of the open age file. And a lot of times a good way to do that is by doubling up your rooks because they support each other and you can come down and start checking and doing stuff. But after bishop f6, my opponent is defending very nicely. Um, you know, you can imagine if I go here, he could just go back. And now the bishop is just covering everything. I can't actually go do anything. So that's why I kind of was like, okay, let me just do something else for now. I push this forward. Um, I wasn't sure, but I thought I would relocate my knight. Because I felt like mm, I have this extra piece. I'm not really using it much. Let me relocate it. So there we go. And here I just attack the bishop. It is a blitz game. So some of these moves happen quickly. Going for the pawn. And something happened here. Not yet. Right here. This was a critical move in my opinion. So remember what I said earlier. How I couldn't invade with my rooks. Because the bishop was sitting on f6. Now... There's no more square for the bishop to go to. So I realized this was going to be a serious threat now. So first of all, I wanted to bring my knight in. Uh, I'm threatening to come here and potentially put some pressure on the pawns. Opponent was trying to stop that. And now I brought the rooks over. And now it's a different story, right? The horse of a different color. The bishop can't go here and stop me. This is very dangerous. I'm threatening checkmate right now. Imagine if black like wastes a move. This is just checkmate in two. Boom, boom, game over, right? So black has to deal with that. So they played rook here, which gives them a place to run to. But still, I saw that I could infiltrate with the rook. And then, you know, I wanted to bring both rooks down and infiltrate, but I wasn't sure if I was going to have time. So what I did was I played rook to b8, attacking the pawn, but also at the same time, opening up the square to bring this rook down. Because once I get two rooks back there, it's really dangerous for black's king. That's exactly what we see. The other rook comes in. And now... This is a checkmate threat, and it's not easy to stop. My opponent played here, which doesn't deal with it, and I just checkmated. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. there's not really a way to stop it. 
Stockfish is not sh showing me any good moves except giving up a rook just to kind of create some space for the king. But I mean, obviously, I'm just going to take it. And then, yeah, it's it wants to use the bishop to defend. Okay, fine. But game is over. So, uh, you know, even after you win a piece, this game you saw, I had to kind of be patient, maneuver my pieces around, and slowly but surely was able to infiltrate along the age file and get the, you know, the nice checkmate here um, at the end. So... Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed those recaps and kind of learned something from my thought process. Even though, those, even though these were just blitz games, I think you can still learn a lot. I think these were pretty well-played games, um, not a ton of mistakes. And so, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that, and I will see you next time. As always, stay sharp. Stay smart. Take care.